<laughs> Do you want presenter mode? Or do you uh, pres yeah, presenter mode, please. the talk while we <laughs> fix all the microphones. All right, I think we're good? Okay. Um, so I'm here to stop something, and that thing is bad science. Um, there has been a, a, a series of papers, pretty much a legacy of, of this kind of stuff, um, and uh, I would like to propose uh, the reasons why I think this is incorrect and a path to actually do this better. Um, and this is pretty important. It's a broad class of research. It goes something like this. Rebufferings incur abandonment rates six times higher than startup latency. So we have here, we're proposing a, a feature called abandonment. That's when a user leaves a video. Um, and we're making equivalences about it and saying like, oh, rebuffering is bad. You should optimize against rebuffering. You should put more join latency. It's telling you how to build your ABR algorithm. Um, and this kind of data is problematic. Uh, and it's problematic for a few reasons, and we'll go over some of them here. Probably the first one we should start with is that it's wrong. Um, this <laughs> seems like uh, a, a pretty big showstopper. Now, a lot of this is published peer-reviewed journals, so uh, I have an advantage in this. Um, but in order to do that, I need you to believe me. <laughs> Because, as it turns out, I can't share all of my data with you. I can't give you access to what I have. Um, so I'm going to do something unusual for me uh, and try and credential myself real quick. So I built the HTML5 player for YouTube. Um, not, the, not the whole thing. That was a, a big project. But I designed the uh, ABR components for that. Um, I was also uh, responsible for launching accidentally and then quickly unlaunching our Dash support <laughs> back in 2013. Um, <laughs> Uh, so the, uh, we did eventually launch it a, a week later after that incident, but uh, so yeah, um, so I've been involved for our Dash effort since the beginning. Um, I've also run more than 500 experiments at YouTube, um, so that's not just shotgun trials, that's actually like I make a prediction, uh, I test the prediction, I found out I'm wrong about the prediction. I mention this because I know what it means to be wrong about ABR, I've done it a lot. Um, now, that's not to say that I'm smarter than any of the people who are publishing this data. Um, that's not the secret. The secret is that I have access to a thing that they don't most of the time. And that is that I can run a true experiment. Um, I can actually change a feature of our ABR, ABR algorithm and run it side by side over different user po or the same user population just sliced um, and see the results. I can change routing, I can improve servers, and I can do all of that um, and measure the differences uh, by doing two different populations. And so what you find is the published academic research tends to be in the form of an observational study, which means they didn't have access to this. They were doing something that measured existing results using an existing piece of infrastructure um, and then ran some numbers over that. Um, one of the most pernicious patterns of this is the quasi-experimental design. Um, I actually think of it as the queasy experimental design. <laughs> and if you're wondering to yourself, how could you make a pun that bad this early? Um, or who allowed you to stand up in front? I remind you, please save all questions for the end. <laughs> we'll have chance for you to harass me at that point. Um, no, a, a better name for the quasi-experimental design is the BYOB pattern. Um, as in, you have an A-B experiment. You don't have a B. You need to invent it. Um, and the way that you do that is you actually say, I'm going to create a control by looking for environmental factors that are the same between a control and a treatment, um, and, uh, and then siphoning off users into two buckets. So a pattern that I've seen a lot is that you have uh, one slice of users that watched a video with a certain length, in a certain quality, they have a certain intrinsic bandwidth, and another slice of users that had those same properties except they experienced a rebuffer. So you're actually forking the logic on uh, a property of the consequence of the ABR algorithm. So either the ABR algorithm worked or it didn't, you rebuffered or you didn't, 
Um, that's not a, that's in experimental design, that's a dependent variable. And so you're going back and making the dependent variable an independent variable. Now this is bad for reasons that you can learn about in stats class, or you can read in a book. Um, I'm not gonna go over that. I'm gonna show you an example. I mean, you should like, it's fun for weird, messed up people like myself to learn about statistics in that way, but that's not the, the important point. The important point is that we can do this data. This is the uh, Hillary Clinton between two ferns video. Um, so it's pretty recent data. Um, I ran this and you find this. The more rebuffers, the longer people stick around in the video. This seems broken. <laughs> but if you think about it, the answer is quite simple. Because let's say, uh, if we're looking back at this query, we see the bandwidth is between 100 and 120 kilobits per second. This is a pretty low bandwidth. So there's people that are likely to incur a rebuffer. If you start watching this video, and for whatever reason you decide to abandon after five seconds into the video, be that you, know, you had bad quality, you didn't like the content, you know, it's, a, it's a particular audience that this video is trying to reach, you're gonna close that tab. And you're gonna close it independently of whether or not you experienced a rebuffer. So you're not going to have a chance to ever get to experience a rebuffer. People who stick around in a video are, have a longer, a, a higher chance to experience a rebuffer because it's a rare event. And rare events are associated with longer sessions intrinsically because they're rare, and so you have to stick around longer for, for the event to happen more. So if you are looking at the events in order to slice out sections of your user population, you're actually automatically biasing your results. And this is really, really challenging to work around in an experimental design. So what would happen is if you get a pile of data like this, you keep adding control conditions until you've got, you've got something that makes sense. And then you can run your analysis over that knowing that everything's internally verified. There's no way to prove that. There's no way to actually know that you've got all the conditions that control for every facet of a user's experience between the two variables. Um, and so this is, this is an important rule in an observational study. You can't slice by a, con uh, by a consequence of the actions, which means that most of the observational studies out there are uh, you know, ipso facto invalid because uh, there's no natural barrier that's slicing users into different populations. So there's nothing really to do an A, B experiment on. You can do an observation, you can correlate, but you can't actually determine the cause of a particular event. Um, Another issue with these trials is that they often operate on a playback level. And this is tricky. Um, this is tricky for the same reasons as before, like your stats teacher will be mad at you for doing this because it violates some rules. Um, uh, but it's also tricky because uh, historically, if you've already rebuffered, you're more likely to rebuffer again. Um, so this is just like one example of like uh, a way in which that property can affect your results. So if you slice out by whether or not you've seen a rebuffer, you're gonna experience some statistical anomalies. <laughs> to tell you about this, the magnitude of the impact of this, I think we should compare it to a considerably simpler uh, model of how to do statistical analysis. Um, and that is the high energy physics experiment at the Large Hadron Collider, um, which compared to ABR design is pretty simple. Um, so, <laughs> The LHC has two detectors, CMS and ATLAS. Both of these have produce phenomenal amounts of data. They actually have a core principle of their design is that they have chips at every re reader, which is looking for anomalies that match a particular signature, discarding most of the data. So they have billions and billions and billions of samples, um, a tremendous amount of data pouring in every second. It's adaptively discarding, so it only focuses on the right one. Uh, over the course of the run from 2011 to 2013, we collected 10.4 ter uh, inverse femtobarns of data um, at some at seven tera electron volts, some at eight tera electron volts. That gives us a pretty good picture of this. So we've got billions and billions of samples coming in. Uh, uh, we're focusing on only the most important samples. And with all of that data, uh, CMS on its own was able to drive the prediction value for the mass anomaly associated with the uh, Higgs boson to a level of four sigma. That's not enough to say that we found the Higgs boson. So we actually had to combine that data with data from the ATLAS detector in order to get to six sigma, which is the gold standard. Um, and after all of that, we still aren't quite certain that the Large Hadron Collider is going to produce a black hole that's going to consume the Earth at any given time. So 
I, I tell you that to give you the idea, like this is one of the, this is the most sophisticated machine mankind has ever built. It took us three years <laughs> to get to Six Sigma. I gathered data from our Dash launch for about a week. I put that data into R, and I did a, a cross-correlated join using a per-playback model, and I got to 400 sigma. That's, so I, you know, this was like right when I started. I was so excited about this result. I was like, okay, we are solved. We can totally prove this. Um, I added another parameter, and I actually drove it up to 600 sigma. Um, so this was, at the Dash launch, we were trying to understand whether or not the impact of fetching the manifest was the reason why playback time was a little bit down when we launched Dash. Um, and so I computed this thing and said, yeah, absolutely. We're, we're totally certain that this is the case. Um, and I added, like, is the video 1080p as another parameter? Um, and to be even more confident, and that was the second run. And it turns out the is the video 1080p at the time in, in 2013 was picking up more on whether or not the video was an ad. And so it filtered out and sliced based on every ad playback, which in fact dramatically changed the data. What I failed to realize in my excitement is that the second result wasn't just stronger, it was backwards. <laughs> I had two conflicting results. So not only did I prove that the LHC was never going to pr produce a black hole, I also proved that it had already consumed the Earth. <laughs> So don't do that. Slice the data using an independent hash function, something that's not per playback, something that's not um, uh, a consequence of any ABR decision. You have to decide up front how you're going to slice your users. So what we do is we generate a daily session ID, and then we just like bucket users based on that daily session ID. Um, and then we'll do uh, summit metrics across the entire population slice, not looking within those population slices. And we'll use that to compute our confidence intervals when we decide what to do this. Now this method will disappoint you because almost always you're gonna do this and find that whatever change you made did not have statistically significant results. And that's probably true. Um, which is, it's frustrating for, you know, you always want flashy results, you want every experiment that you launch to do something, even if it does bad, you just want to know that it did something. Um, and you can do like really risky analysis that violates all these statistical properties to decide what you want to do, what ABR changes you want to roll out. But you've got to be really, really, really careful when you're actually producing an answer to decide whether or not you want to ship something to not lie to yourself by trusting your analysis. Because almost always the things that you bring to the table in order to analyze the experiment will also be brought um, when you're designing your feature. And if you do both of those at the same time, you're just going to confirm your own bias as you're designing your algorithm. So it's important to slice based on independent metrics. Your stats teacher was right. It is really important when we have big data. Um, another problem that faces a lot of these studies is that they're looking at the wrong metric. Um, so one thing that people like to optimize for is the average play time. Um, and this is super problematic because in a lot of cases, what that means is the average play time per video. Um, I hate this metric. I hate it because it has steered me wrong so many times. Um, to give you an example of how this might work conceptually, uh, I will note that YouTube often competes with itself. Um, and uh, a good example of that is the recommendations tab. You're watching a video. This is History of Japan by Bill Wirtz. It's one of the most amazing videos ever produced. You should watch it. Um, but even as we do this, we're trying to pump alternatives at you. So if you get bored for half a second, if your attention wavers, which you won't on this video, again, it's amazing, um, the, uh, but you have the choice to immediately switch to something else. If we get better at recommendations, you're going to click on them. You're going to click on them when you get bored of your current video. You're probably going to spend more time on site, but you're definitely going to abandon the videos you're on more often. Uh, now, if everything goes well, we'll have metrics that do go up, and we'll use those. But if we're using pull per video metrics, that's not what our business is built around. We don't care about how long you spend on one video. We care how long you spend on YouTube. Um, and so trying to pin that turns out to we're optimizing for the wrong thing, and we're optimizing backwards in a lot of cases. Um, that's not just recommendations. We see this with ABR improvements as well. Um, when we improve the start time, the join, the join latency, when we make the join latency go down, um, but I'll just say improving play playback start time so that it sounds like we're going up. Um, uh, when we do that, watch time per video goes down. And 
We have a hypothesis for why this is. I can't prove it. We don't have enough data. There's not enough statistical power to, to understand the minds of the users at this point. Uh, we're going to get some FR, MRI machines and load them into Android pretty soon so that we can <laughs> run that scan. Um, but it's that when, if a user trusts that we're always going to be fast, they never hesitate to click on a video that they're interested in because they know that they can, they can go to it, they can see it, they can go back. Um, it improves the level of user trust with our UI. Um, I can't test that, I can't prove that. It seems to be true from all the experiments that we run, um, but we don't rely on that. Um, now for this one, improving playback start time does what to the watch time per visit? I think this is time for an audience participation thing. So everyone, stand up. Thank you. Um, all right, now, remain standing if you think that watch time per visit will go up, and sit down if you think watch time per visit will go down. <laughs> All right, everybody ready? Everyone's wrong. It depends. <laughs> so it depends, it depends on where you shave the watch time off. So we split, we split a, the watch time calculation or the join latency calculations into cold sessions. So the first time you visit the site. And if you make cold sessions faster, watch time per visit goes down because you can hit the site, watch a video, and back out. And the video will have started in half a second. But if you're like at work or in the middle of class or something like that, um, and you do this and you back out of your session and the video's already started, now it counts as a session. You had a view. Um, but you abandon the session so quickly. So if that join latency was longer, you could see that it was YouTube.com. You realize you're in an environment where your volume's up, you don't want to play sound, and you back out of it before a session starts. So by doing that, we create more sessions, but for, and for users who want to come on the site, they get on the site faster. So this is a good thing. But we've actually made average session time go down because the, the, there are, it's a possible to start more really short sessions. Um, and so average watch time per visit is still a bad metric, even though it's sort of what we're optimizing for. It's a good proxy for user experience when you filter out all of the <coughs> random things. But you, again, you don't know that your filtering conditions are right. On the other hand, if you make mid-video playback, like uh, video to video faster, watch time does go up per visit because people are more willing to spend time on the site, um, as we'd expect. Um, now, if we compute this as the sum of values in each of the population slices, um, then we can say, like, so we split the, split the population into each 20, all of the 20 slices. We don't look at how many people are in each slice or what the metrics are. We just see that in the experiment group, if we make things faster, um, that overall watch time goes up most of the time. Because there are exceptions even to that, um, because we have to talk about genuinely improving watch time, which we'll get to later. We'll talk about why the improving has an asterisk. We'll say that the usually mostly applies because any change is resulting for experimental confidence. Um, and this kind of sentence is exactly why people get this wrong. So it's so hard. It's so hard to talk about this because you have to exceptionalize everything. You have to say, well, this isn't precise enough in your, in your language. Um, it's, it's hard. I mean, this is why you hire a data scientist, right? Like, it's important to get the terminology correct, and it's really challenging to do it. Um, and it makes communicating about these things casually challenging, especially when you're like talking to your execs about it. Um, but, uh, but it's important. Um, the conclusion of this section is that you must pick metrics that matter to your business. Um, and you can't settle for proxy metrics. So like the average watch time per view cannot be a proxy metric for overall site-wide engagement. You really need to find a way to measure the things that matter to your business. Now at YouTube, we'd like to measure user happiness. Um, that's the thing we actually are striving for. Uh, if we could make users delighted with their YouTube experience in 30 seconds and then get them off, off the site, get them off the site, <laughs> that was not a joke in the script, um, uh, uh, then we would, we would be thrilled to do that. Um, that's probably not what happens. So we have a proxy metric, and that proxy metric is overall watch time. The more people t time people spend on the site, probably the more happy they are with YouTube. We're not perfectly thrilled with this metric, but it's served us pretty well so far. Um, again, I want to emphasize, watch time per view is particularly pernicious. Do not use it. OK, um, moving on from that one. 
another problem is that uh, all of these issues are trade-offs. So in that initial sentence construction, it was like, join latency is bad, but rebuffers are worse. So you should just get rid of all your rebuffers. Now, as we know, you can't like, just get rid of all your rebuffers. Um, you have to make some kind of trade-off. Either you're going to uh, spend you know, trade-off bit rate for, for, or join latency for one of those things, or uh, in the worst case, you're just going to have to like, buy more servers and pay your content creators less, which may result in less, less high-quality content. Like that, something is always being traded off no matter what you do. Um, at YouTube, we are definitely aware of the implications of our quality trade-offs in our ABR algorithm. So this is a shot of the quality selector, which I talk about a lot. I deeply love the quality selector because it gives me my very best data. Um, the uh, impact of a change in video quality is really hard to measure directly. Um, and so what we found is that uh, video quality is an experiential metric. It's something that accumulates over time. You like a service or you don't, you get an, an overall impression based on the consistent video quality that you experience. So if you make a change to video quality by like spending more time encoding some videos or spending less time or doing something like that, um, that needs to happen for every video that users watch in order to like bathe them in it over time. So it's hard to do that as a pure experiment of how can we look at just the, the experienced video quality. So what we usually do is like bitrate trade-offs. Um, we have an experiment that runs every so often just so that we can check our assumptions. Um, one that lowers the bit rates of the video target. So like 720p, let's say it targets a megabit at VP9. Um, we have one arm that targets 1.5 megabits and another arm that targets 600 kilobits. Um, and when we did this, um, we found some unusual results. We found that manual quality selections, the times that people interact with that gear menu, they go up in both the cases where we raise the quality and we lower the quality. This seems a little paradoxical, so we dug further. Um, we found that when you raise bit rates, people interact with that quality menu right at the start because they see that that HD badge didn't come on. They open the menu, they're like, this isn't 720, I want it to be 720, and they manually select 720. That's AV artwork, that we did the right thing. And the user overrode it because they had a preconception about what they wanted. And we respect that. Like YouTube, we don't, you know, we'd like to always be perfect so that the user would never interact with it. But we don't begrudge somebody for coming and saying, I want 720 no matter what. That's fine. Um, what we found is that when we lowered bit rates, people were like, oh, I'm getting 720. That's great. Um, and then it would get to a challenging section of the video. And they would be like, this isn't real 720. And they would go into the quality menu and upgrade to 1080. Um, and this tells us that users are actually, like, video quality is making a difference in users' perception. It does matter. It's really hard to measure. It's not going to be an immediate business impact, but it is something users notice and respond to. Um, so that was really good. Um, we found that 2.5% of users will do this on a daily basis. They will interact with the quality menu once a day. Um, the number raises to 10% monthly. Um, and a sh kind of shocking number is the proportion of those users that are really our most engaged users. So when you compute it based on watch time, 25% of our watch time comes from users that have interacted with the quality menu in the past month. That's huge. It's also an indication that like, we're not doing a, as good a job on ABR as we'd like to. Um, now, fortunately, a lot of this is saying that people want to have a 360 window, but they always want to start in 720. Um, or that they are on a low bandwidth connection and that they want to cap it down to 240. And we, we do some clever things. We like have a half ABR mode, where if you've used the quality selector in the past, but are currently not manually selecting a quality, we'll treat that previous quality selection as a ceiling. This was the result of like a year's worth of PM work. Um, and it's super confusing, because I did the PM work, and I'm not qualified to do that. Um, uh, but the important metric is that only about 1% of users have to use this more than once a day. So they start off their session, and then um, they, they make that selection, and, and that sticks for the rest of the day. So that's pretty good. Um, uh, and that information isn't, isn't captured in, in any of those studies. The fact that those uh, trade-offs are being made, um, they're important to users. They're not being captured in a, in a recommendation. So um, problem four is that your users use your service. This is a problem. Um, I have a story about this. The story uh, involves the Olympics opening ceremonies. So I watched this at my friend Matt Ward's house. 
Um, and I watched this uh, without a cable connection. So we actually subscribed to a seven-day trial of an OTT service that streams cable uh, for you. I'm not going to name the service. Because as we were watching, um, we decided to start, we were irritated. <laughs> the streaming quality. So we got, our, so got out some nice wine and took a sip for every hiccup in the stream, everything that lasted about less than two seconds. Took two sips of wine for every time a segment got skipped, um, like it would entirely drop a five second segment. And then every time the, the video quality would adapt to the highest possible setting while the audio simultaneously adapted to the lowest, we had three sips. I got so drunk that I literally <laughs> danced my way home. <laughs> But I still watched the entire Olympics opening ceremonies. Well, like to Columbia or whatever, but the, like the opening part, right? Like I had no other way to get that content. I was already committed to this platform. So by any measure of engagement, I didn't abandon that stream during a rebuffer. I abandoned that stream when I was done watching it. But I resented every second of that. <laughs> you can bet I'm never, never subscribing to that streaming service. Um, like they've lost me as a customer forever. And that's, so if you're, if you're doing observational analysis of this stuff, it's, it's actually tremendously hard to get at that information because it doesn't take into account the environmental factors of how much your users want your service. Now, you might say that that story about me dancing through the three doesn't, street isn't really data, and you'd be right. Um, and so here's some more data. Um, this is a, a tap to retry screen. We have these on our Android app. We have these on iOS. We have something related on desktop um, where people just know to refresh. Um, one poor user hit this so often that they had to tap to retry 100 times in a day. Um, and they still did it. Now, that's phenomenal dedication. Like, <laughs> I, could not, I could not possibly imagine wanting to wa watch anything that much, that I would just sit there and keep tapping at it. I would be so frustrated. But this user did it. Um, I want to give you like, a sense of just how bad that is. So if I've got it, oh, is it? Hold on. Let me drop out of this mode. So I have here 16 dramatic chipmunks. We're going to watch it. I'm not even get, going to get to 100 chipmunks. We're going to get to like 50. That's about 50 events in parallel. So that, that happened. So imagine double that. Imagine having to do that manually. Um, that's awful. Like, and somebody did that. Um, you might say that's still not data. You're right. Um, so what if I told you that 10,000 people do this daily? Like, this is dedication. That is, that is on a curve, like that's not an anomaly. There is a there is a perfectly like power law curve that explains how often people are willing to click this. Ten thousand users hit the one hundred events or more, but uh, like bump on that curve. Um, most users know that they can tap to retry, and they do whatever it takes to get back to YouTube in under sixty seconds. Um, the median time for returning to YouTube from a fatal error where they have to kill the app, they have to restart their Wi-Fi. Um, it's under 60 seconds. And we also know that the people who are watching these sessions experience longer session times, so we should deliver more of these fatal errors. <laughs> I'm kidding, of course. Um, so, but it, it goes to show like the, the level of dedication to, the, to, to your product. And that is a consequence. Oh, yeah, and there's one more stat, which is that hundreds of thousands of people um, per day spend more time buffering than playing. And that excludes short sessions. That's a, that's a real metric. Um, they will watch a, a five-minute video and spend six minutes loading it. Um, it's, f it's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. Um, and it's because people don't have any other choice. Here's one more data point. Um, this is the cool pad. It's not an iPad. It's a cool pad. Um, we've given it a gold star. Uh, this device is the most error-prone popular device in North America. <laughs> when we had a network outage on this device, 
Um, we had a network outage on a, on, a, on a few devices as we were upgrading SSL recently. Um, it was for security. Everybody will benefit from it in the long run. Um, but right now, immediately, it resulted in some failing playbacks. And we got messages in our feedback. And the messages didn't say, I, I can't watch YouTube. They said, I tried toggling Wi-Fi and restarting the phone, which usually works, and I still can't watch YouTube. These people know our product. They know their devices. They have go through so much pain to get there. This isn't even the saddest thing. The saddest message I ever got was this one. <laughs> I feel so bad about this one. Because they were in one of my experiments. <laughs> with great power and all that. So yeah, your problem is your users use your service. The problem restated is that users know how to work around your bad service. Like you're doing something wrong to somebody because you're a video provider on the internet and it still doesn't work right, right? So somebody out there is doing extraordinary things to get your service right. Which means that a bunch of other people who don't know how to do this will never come back to your service again. And you will never be able to measure this. This has two important consequences. One is that you, you yourself will apply your own privilege when understanding, attempting to understand how to design your algorithms, how to set your error thresholds. Um, we had on iOS, we had re for a long time, we would time out after 30 seconds of rebuffering. We only just like looked back at the data and realized that this was a terrible choice for people in India. Now iOS in India isn't a huge segment, but it's big enough, right? And we were arbitrarily making this experience more unreliable. Um, the other problem, part of this is that you can't measure the impact of a fix because all of those users that you've already burned by how bad your service is have abandoned you. And they won't come back for a long time. Um, they'll come back on a whim. You know, if it's a free service, if it's a paid service, that you really need to dig to, to get people to resubscribe. Um, but even if it's a free service, they, they might come back later and notice that it's better. But you won't see this right away in your metrics. So if you run an experiment that improves startup time um, uh, by by, uh, I'm sorry, if you run an experiment that improves startup time, then you won't see this. You won't see that it raises watch time because the users who need things to start faster are no longer coming to you. What you will see is that the, uh, the only way to get a, a result is actually take those numbers and make them worse because it will cause the users that are right on the edge of giving up on your service to actually give up. And so those will go away. And so when we say that we get numbers about improving things, we almost never see an improvement from uh, an ABR improvement right away. What we do see is that if we go a while with the new improvement once we've rolled it out and then revert it to previous levels using an experiment that makes a, a couple different trade-offs or even intentionally injects a delay, then we see the fall off. So people, we experience user growth and that user growth is what's driving additional watch time. Mostly, you know, at YouTube, you can run out of recommendations. You can run out of good things to watch in a day. Um, like it's billions of hours of video and, and yet you can still do this because recommendations is still an unsolved problem. Um, but uh, that's the limiting factor. It's not whether or not you're, you're going to like watch one extra video because you don't read buffer. So you have to take that account into your experimental design. Now we can make a bunch of predictions why this is true. Um, I don't want to do that because I don't have the evidence to substantiate it. Um, what I will say is that I'm really skeptical of any study that comes in the form of, if you do this, you're going to get X percent more engagement. We don't have a framework that ever indicates that that's, that's a reality. What we actually see is you will make more users OK with your service, and in the long run, that will benefit. So the conclusion of this is improve your fundamentals anyway, because you don't, you don't understand right now why, how you're letting users down. You will later. Um, another problem uh, with these experimental designs is that your service is growing. Again, like these are good things to have, right? Um, so presumably if your service is on the internet, it's growing because the size of the internet is growing. Uh, it's growing in places like India. Um, we have a metric called mean time retreat and rebuffers. We want to optimize this metric, all things being equal. Um, MTBR is pretty simple to calculate. So if you play a video for 20 minutes, you rebuffer twice, your MTBR is 10 minutes. It's just like numerator over denominator. Um, now, I can get a 37% in this. One of our core metrics that we track, we report it to our executive staff. Um, and I can get a 37% gain in this, and I haven't done it, um, which you know, it's probably not great for my career, but it's good for our users um, because the approach that I take to do this is if you rebuffer more than 25 times in a playback, we just kill it. Um, we say no more video for you. 
Um, and this only comes with a 0.4% watch time penalty, which is, you know, it's in the noise for how we do it. Um, and it just takes all of those bad playbacks and makes them go away. Um, now, I'm not going to do this because I prefer to fix those playbacks. I want those users to eventually turn into more engaged users who have fewer rebuffers than 25. Um, but it does illustrate that if you're not careful, like we wouldn't design that experiment, but maybe we do it by accident. Maybe we cleverly add like a retry limit so that we protect our servers. And that retry limit ends up accidentally tanking those playbacks in the long term. Um, so it's a metrics positive change. It looks like, oh, we've reduced load on our servers. These, these MTBR went up. We don't really notice the fact that we've actually hurt users in the process. I don't have a simple fix for this. Um, I do have a name for it. Uh, we call it a mix shift. Um, and that, that's anything that, that takes a, a piece of traffic and sloshes it over somehow or lowers something in order to get a better MTBR improvement. And if you're, you want your service to grow, um, you have to make sure that you're managing for the very low end of the market because those are the people who your ABR improvements are going to target the most. Um, there's not an easy answer for that. You just need to think and you need to slice your data carefully on independent variables. So use like country or um, a bandwidth value that does not change, like a predicted bandwidth value that doesn't change based on control or experiment. It's something that you have server side, you pre-compute in order to decide what treatment to apply rather than observed bandwidth. Um, there's one last problem uh, class which is um, really difficult to defend against, um, and it's the self-sabotaging experiment. Um, so let's say you have an ABR, uh, this has been proposed in a number of ABR pa players, papers, but uh, if you have an ABR algorithm that attempts to use multiple TCP streams to improve your overall throughput, um, you can have this and it will individually look good because you've taken up a larger slice of the internet, you've taken more of the reach, retransmit fraction for yourself, um, and that will look good from an individual level, but as soon as you try and push that um, to large numbers of, of uh, users across the world, you'll notice that all of your servers have now collapsed because they're retransmitting way more than they should. You've lost overall throughput and efficiency on your servers, so this is not good. The real bad problem about this is that well, they will start looking good in a small experiment, and then you launch it and you have a holdback that uses the old system, and they will still look good even when you have the holdback. So there is no way to catch these. You just have to think them through. It will make all of your metrics look better in the short term. They will hurt your service in the long term. Now, if you're not managing your own CDN, this may not be as relevant to you, but you'll find patterns of like cache behavior or something, someplace where you've, you've just really got to be careful and pay attention and understand what the actual underlying changes are um, that are making this happen. Um, it's really hard to catch. I'm sorry, I don't have a simpler solution. Um, the worst problem, though, with all of the papers that you'll find in academics uh, is that your service is not YouTube, because most of these things are just studying YouTube traffic with observational studies. Um, problem is our service isn't YouTube either. The thing that they're studying is usually like a tiny fraction of users who've opted in to a certain, like, install a Chrome extension to download all of your, like, user experience data. Uh, which does not represent the true slice. And even within YouTube, we'll find dramatically different behavior. Manual quality selection is different from people watching YouTube video or watching music videos versus watching gaming videos. Um, or live streams have completely different ABR characteristics and totally different set of trade-offs. Um, so, uh, so there's that. So that's I, I ran out of problems and I ran out of time. Um, but I'd like to I'd like to thank you for uh, not abandoning this talk. <laughs> and I'll reward you with all the outtakes of me trying to do that jump. <laughs> so, uh, so that happened. All right. Thank you. This time I will carry around micro the microphone combo to everybody. Any questions? There have to be questions after that. Okay. Do you use time of day to then dimension all that data again based upon like, you know, internet levels and things change during the time of day? We, uh, we use it in order to understand how our ABR algorithms are, are working and to design improvements. We don't use it when we're evaluating the ABR algorithms themselves. We want them to be consistent and work everywhere. So uh, we try not to do it as an input, but we definitely like, you have to understand uh, you know, time of day considerations of 
uh, here's the difference between your algorithm when your backbone is going under congestion collapse and when it's not. Um, and we have different retry scenarios and try to do heuristics, but it's not like we're explicitly reading the clock and conditioning it. Um, we also see time of the month is perhaps more important than time of day. Um, increasingly, as people go mobile, their data plans expire and they start getting throttled. And so we'll see when we have, we have to run experiments for a full month now um, because they will behave so differently at the end of a month than the beginning of the month. Something that uses more data um, will look great at first and then as the month wears on, they'll actually like reduce watch time overall because uh, an experiment, it has caused a user to run out of data on a throttled plan sooner. The, the overall watch time uh, you mentioned does work for both live and on-demand, but how does, are there other, other metrics that you look for live streaming? Um, so there's uh, proximity to head is really important, or live latency, like screen to screen time. Um, and, uh, you know, honestly, we're, like we should have completely redesigned this. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure. MTBR has a different relationship. Overall watch time has a different relationship because you want to make sure that nobody's dropping off. Um, live streaming right now is still such a hard problem and an unsolved problem that like we're working on how to minimize abandonment rates. Just like you know, a problem happened with your connection. Let's how can we possibly get it to retry? Um, and so we aren't like sitting on a, a pile of, of super advanced metrics for this. Um, it's, we're working towards it, and I'm sure we'll have more talks to give. Yeah, Steve, so in order to measure the, in order. Both microphones. experiments, do you see that no matter how much you improve the ABI algorithm, this opt-out opt rate will saturate at some level? We've actually been able to drive it down substantially over time. Now, that may mean that we started from a place where we were just awful. Um, but uh, there, it's, ne it's never going to hit zero. You're always going to, you can never defend against the hot pocket in a microwave case. So you always need some room between uh, your uh, maximum possible throughput and your actual chosen throughput in order to account for something that you've never seen before in a session, in order to have an ABR that can resist even the, the tiniest flakeouts. And uh, as a consequence for that, there are users who are willing to accept a rebuffer um, and who uh, will, will force themselves to a higher quality. Um, and that's a, an explicit signal of, we, assume, we start off with the assumption that most users never want to see a rebuffer. That's just not true for some users. We accept that. Uh, yeah, okay. Don't tape these things together after this. <laughs> it looks like, to me, what you're saying is basically you want each of your resolutions to be the best quality where it looks good, and you wouldn't want like 10 1080Ps and half of them look like crap, but they're lower bit rates. You'd actually want each one to just look good enough, and they might jump from the lower ones because they want a higher bit rate, but at least they don't go to 720p and say, oh, this one's low bit rate, and I want the higher one. That sounds like we're wasting a lot of bits by making these crappier versions of each resolution. YouTube's corpus is enormous. It's absolutely enormous. Um, we have second-order cache effects when we have introduced too many formats for the same video that will actually degrade quality. It's better for our delivery if we just opt have one that's good enough um, and you know, we continually try to improve the standard of good enough. If you're running a small transactional VOD service and, ha and your users are paying for it and your corpus is small enough to actually be cached, um, maybe that doesn't make sense. Okay, this is the last question. How much can other people learn from what you've learned at YouTube and to what extent does everyone just have to do all of this from scratch themselves? That is a good question. Um, uh, probably 70% is transferable. <laughs> so, for whatever that, um, 
Oh, you two, we haven't, so like the, I was, I've been staring at these papers for like four years and being like, why, why isn't anyone fixing this? Like, why does no one realize it's a problem? And I finally realized it's because I wasn't talking about it. Like, we at YouTube haven't been going out and correcting. We haven't been publishing papers. We probably can, and uh, I'm going to try and do that. And uh, I expect some of that to be transferable. Um, there's a level of polish that's got to be per content, per service, per context. Um, and so, like, you know, the quality menu, we will never make that go away. Um, uh, we're actually adding it to pro every product that we don't have it on right now. Um, so even, even for ourselves, we can't get it perfect. So no, nobody could ever copy all of what we did and expect to get it perfect as well. Great. All right. Thank, you. Thank you. Cool pad. <laughs> Hold on, you need this. <laughs> OK, so we're going into a 15-minute break. I think we're uh, into a 12-minute break and 30 seconds. Uh, so feel free to grab more coffee, uh, mill around, hang out with uh, some of our awesome sponsors, but we'll see you back here. Also, tweet at and follow.